And we're starting a new series today. We, we're done with Colossians now, and we're starting a new series called Hard to Believe. So to kick that off, I'd like you to open up your Bibles to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. I'm going to read. Um, we're not going to cover all of the text I'm going to read, but I'm going to read uh, quite a lengthy passage and, and then pray, and it will set up perfectly not only this message, but the entire series that we're going to cover. So we're in the eighth chapter of John, so please turn there, and we're going to start with verse 12 of chapter 8 in the Gospel of John. Jesus, in verse 12, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, you're bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I came from and where I'm going, but you do not know where I come from or where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet, even if I do judge, my judgment's true, for it's not I alone who judge, but it's I and the Father who sent me. In your law, it's written that the testimony of two people is true. I'm the one who bears witness about myself. And the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, therefore, well, where is your father? Jesus answered him, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. So he said to them again, I'm going away. You will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself? Since he says, where I'm going, you cannot come. He said to them, you're from below and I'm from above. You are of this world, but I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they said to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, just what I've been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you. And much to judge, but he who sent me is true. And I declare to the world that what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said to them, When you've lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, Many believed in him. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We're offsprings of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say we will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, Everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you're offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my words find no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father and you do what you have heard from your father. Father, we call upon you this morning in uh, in reverence and humility and we are asking holy spirit that you would open up our hearts our eyes our minds and our ears to the truth not only that we might know the truth but that that truth might actually set us free as we begin this series and looking at difficult uh, things people that struggle with in terms of what they believe father just pray that you give us wisdom and that you would reveal the scriptures to us that we might be moved that christ might be exalted give me words this morning in jesus name amen Take that statement, Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, verse 32, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That's, that's something that our culture is very familiar with. Most of you have heard that statement before. Maybe not all of you are aware that that statement actually originated in John chapter 8, verse 32. Those are Jesus' words. And what he says here is that if you know the truth, If you follow me, and my words, they abide or remain in you, 
you, you not, only, not only will you know what's true or that which corresponds to reality, that truth will actually liberate you and you will be free. Now, did everyone buy that? No, they didn't. Not, and in the context of the, the scripture that I just read, not everybody agrees with Jesus. In fact, the eighth chapter, I didn't continue to read, but if I continue to read through the rest of the chapter, the exchange between Jesus and the Pharisees about this issue of truth and who he is becomes so heated that by the end of the chapter, they picked up stones to stone him. So obviously, they're not in agreement that he has the truth. It starts out in verse 12, or verse 12 and 13, he makes a statement and then they tell him, what you say is not true. So Jesus says, I have the truth. And they said, no, you don't. What we're going to do over the next 12 weeks is we're going to look at the the 12 most common objections that people have to the Christian faith. The Bible, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Jesus says, come to me, I'll set you free. And some people do, and some people are like, no, I don't believe that this is true. So we're going to look at 12 reasons, 12 reasons people are reluctant. Everybody has doubts. Everybody has doubts. Just show of hands, how many of you have doubts at times? You have them now or you've had them in the past. If you didn't raise your hand, you don't think often enough, (laughs) quite frankly. Everybody doubts. Everybody struggles with, is this true? Now, there's two types of people that doubt. There are people who believe, yet they are insecure in their belief and they're not sure if what they believe is true, but yet they believe it. It's kind of like the guy who said to Jesus, he says, if you believe, I can do this. And he says, do you believe? He says, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. So we kind of fall into that category, some of us. And so it's important for us to look at these hard questions so that your faith will be strengthened. Here's the deal. If you're a Christian and you have doubts and you do not examine and scrutinize what you believe, you will have a very, very weak faith. And that weak faith will fall and it will crumble when you face trials, tribulations, or persecution. And those persecutions could be intellectual. So if you don't examine those those difficulties in the context of a believing family who can honestly grapple with the scriptures here, then you'll deal with them in the world in a, in a place which in a, in a context which is hostile. Note to parents, you, you, you look at those little angels that you brought to church. Some of them are not so angelic, and you realize that. But they, they made a profession of faith, and they love Jesus, right? And they don't have doubts. Wrong. They just don't want to tell you that they have doubts because they don't want to hurt your feelings because it's your, your, and dad, your mom and dad's face. faith. They, they struggle too. And so what we're going to do, parents, is it's, it's important for you to bring your kids so that as we go through this, they can, be, they can have their, their doubts and the things that they're struggling with or the things that they haven't even thought of yet, but they will be introduced to later. You can, you can wrestle with these. So that's from a context of, yes, I believe, but I doubt. There's also doubters that are skeptics. They don't buy this. They don't believe this. It's not just they doubt. They just don't believe. But there are specific roadblocks that hinder them from even considering the plausibility of the claims of Christ. And so we're going to to look at those. Now, those skeptics fall into two categories. Skeptics that are interested in looking for truth and skeptics that have no desire and don't care to know. If you fall into either one of those categories, I would challenge you um, that we will treat your doubts, we will treat your, your, your concerns with respect, you will not be mocked, you will be heard as, as we're going through these. I will not make fun of anybody who does not believe in what, what, uh, what the Bible teaches, but I will challenge you to scrutinize your doubts with the same veracity and the tenacity that you scrutinize what the Bible teaches. Okay, So scrutinize what you say you believe with the same degree of intensity that you scrutinize what you don't believe. Is that fair? I think that's totally fair. So that's what we're going to do. So let's, let's jump right into this. Let's take a look at the first of the 12 objections. The first of the 12 objections has to do with the concept of truth in and of itself. Look at the text here. Jesus says, if you abide, that word abide means remain. It means if you stick. If you stick in my word and my word sticks in you, well, then you're truly my disciples. That means you're my followers. And, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. There's two problems that our culture has with Jesus' statement. And they're related, but there's two problems they have to do with verse 32. And that is, first of all, the idea that truth can even be known. 
Many people in our culture say that truth is relative. Nobody can really know what the truth is, like there's just one. But, but rather, truth in and of itself can't be known. And then, those that make truth claims restrict. It doesn't set you free. To the contrary, people that are making absolute truth claims like Jesus and like Christianity and like the Bible, that doesn't set you free. It, it, it restricts you. And, and it doesn't cause freedom it doesn't give freedom it restricts it's a ball and chain and the way to be free is to to simply deny that there is true because there isn't true okay that's that's a very very common sentiment um maybe not phrased in the way that you you heard me me heard me say it just now but it'll, it'll i'll try to make it make sense of it as we go here so let's take a look first of all start with a baseline definition truth you go through chapter eight truth is mentioned about a dozen times Okay, truth or true. What do we even mean when we use the word truth? The word truth defined is simply that which corresponds to reality. That which corresponds to reality. So if, it, if something I say corresponds to that which is real, then you would say that is true. If what I say doesn't correspond to reality, you would say, well, that's not true. That, that's what truth means. Okay, so... Here's the first one. Let's tackle this. Truth can't be known. Truth can't be known. That takes two forms. First of all, people will say, okay, Brooks, you say that Jesus Christ, he's, he says the truth, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Well, answer me this, smarty pants. Um, do you know everything? No. Well, then if you don't know everything, you can't possibly know that what Jesus said is true. Now, now follow that. The reasoning goes like this. Since you can't know everything, and can anybody know everything? Of course not. Can't know everything. But since you can't know everything, you can't know anything for sure. In other words, you can't be 100% certain that anything is true because you can't know everything. Now, let me ask this question. Do you live your life that way? No, you don't. Nobody lives their life that way. How many fingers am I holding up? One. How many fingers am I holding up behind my back? You had a one in five shot. Of, get, of getting this right, okay? It's two. But here's the deal. I ask you this question, how many fingers am I holding up in front of my face? You say one, and I say, how many fingers am I holding up behind my back? And you say two, and I say, stop! You can't be certain that I'm holding up one finger in front of my face until you can tell me how many fingers am I holding up behind my back. Does that make sense? No. Just because you can't know everything about everything doesn't mean the things that are right in front of your face can't be verified as either true or false. Nobody lives their life actually believing that. Okay? They make statements about that, and here's one that's related. Here's one that's related, although it goes a step further. It doesn't say that since you can't know everything, therefore you can't know anything specifically is true. It just simply says there isn't truth. Truth doesn't exist. You can't know truth because there isn't truth. Now, I want you to analyze both of those claims. I want you to look at them. I want you to think. Use your head. Some of you might get blisters on your brain this morning. Like when you use shovel and you've never actually worked with your hands, you get blisters. Your brain might blister today. So what's wrong with those two claims? What are both of those claims? Truth claims. If someone asks me, and says, it says to me, you can't know the truth because there is no truth. Here's how I would respond. Is the statement you just made true? If they say yes, then the statement itself is meaningless. If they say no, the statement itself is meaningless. So what? It's meaningless. Who cares? It doesn't matter. It's, it, you see that there is a logical it's not, the logic just, it's just off track. There's no logic in that. To say you can't know the truth because there is no truth implies that they know the truth. Otherwise, they couldn't make such a statement with any authority. Okay, now that's fairly intellectual, fairly heady. Let's, let's move on to something that's a little bit more in our, in our uh, day-to-day life. This most of you have probably not dealt in this realm unless you take philosophy classes and you've been in the classroom. And then you step outside the classroom and this is totally irrelevant. Nobody thinks this way. Okay? But here's, here's where people do think. This, this, this probably many of you have this mindset. And that is the truth 
is relative. It's not so much that truth doesn't exist, but it's a moving target. It varies from culture to culture. It's determined by cultural context, where you were raised, how you were raised, what values you had, what time you were raised in, what continent, what culture, all of these things. So what's true for one culture is not necessarily true for another. So if this is your truth over here, you don't impose your truth on their pe- these people over here because they have a different culture, so their truth is different. So culture determines truth. It's relative. It moves. It shifts. You can't know truth. Truth is determined by, uh, by cultures in specific time and place. And out of that comes this very, very popular sentiment. All religions are true and equally valid. How many of you have heard that? Okay. So you say that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and life, and somebody says, well, that's your truth, but I believe this, and my truth is just as true as your truth. So this is true for me, and that's true for you. I remember the first time I shared my faith with with my family, my family, my dad said, well, that's good for you, it's just not for me. So he didn't deny the truth of what I believed, he just simply said it was irrelevant because it wasn't it wasn't what he believed. And it kind of threw me because I thought, well, if it's true, shouldn't everyone believe it? Uh, I, that kind of threw me as a, as a young Christian in, in my 20s. I didn't know what to do with, 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 the, with the idea that someone would say all religions are true and equally valid. And out of that flows this. It's wrong to say that any culture is wrong. It's wrong to say that any culture is wrong. Again, what's wrong with those two claims? They require an understanding of truth to even make them reasonably understandable. You can't make either one of those claims unless you know truth. Do you, do you see how kind of truth is foundational? You, if you step off the plank and say that there is no truth, well then, then we're just all kind of floating out in the cosmos and nothing actually sticks. Let's, let's take, a look at, uh, take a look at something that uh, was said in Time Magazine online in 2008. I found this quote Uh, in Tim Keller's book, The Reason for God, which I will be quoting from liberally. um, And I encourage you to read it at some time. It's it's very similar, although it takes a little bit different order and he tackles some other issues that I will not. The Reason for God by Tim Keller. And he's talking talking about this, this, uh, the exclusivity of of Christianity, another sermon I'll get to later. But he says, uh, Klein says that anyone who believes that there are inferior religions, well, that person's a right-wing extremist. He then it flows out of the fact that the, the claim that all religions are equally valid and equally true. So therefore, if you assert that what you believe is true and what someone else believes isn't true and they should believe as you do, well, that makes you a right-winged extremist, right? That you follow the logic? Okay, now, it begs the question, is Mr. Klein's statement true? I'm not playing philosophical games here. I'm asking you, is it true? If it's true, let's, let's just assume for a second that all of you not in agreement. Yes, Mr. Klein is correct. Anyone who makes a claim that this religion is superior to this religion and this, this religion is true while this religion is not true, those people are the fundamentalists. They're the right-winged extremists. You ready? What about ISIS? What about ISIS? When you compare the, the radical Islamists in, in ISIS, which is beheading uh, Christians, crucifying Christians, murdering people who do not believe and will not profess, okay? if you compare that with the expression of Christianity, which was embodied by Mother Teresa in Calcutta, when she lived a life of poverty and gave herself exclusively to the poor and the dying in the caste, lowest caste system in India, are you willing to say to me, are you willing to be intellectually honest with yourself and state that they are the equivalent? Are you willing to say that the expression of Islam as, found, uh, as seen in ISIS is inferior or, or, or is, is a, of equal status with that of Mother Teresa's faith. W- would anybody say that? Now, many of you say, well, that's a... No, I wouldn't say that, but, 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 but that's not fair. That's not fair. They're perverting. They're perverting the teaching of Islam. Does that not require that Islam has a teaching which is true that they're perverting? 
You cannot dodge this. If you say ISIS is wrong, you are a right-winged extremist. Do you... S now, now I, lo I just love the irony here. I just can't even stand it. I'm going to explode. Joe Klein, in making this statement... What is he saying about the faith of people who he's calling right-wing extremists? That it's inferior to those who don't, which makes him a right-wing extremist. You can't dodge this. You can say that truth is relative, and you can say that all religions are equal, but unless you believe all religions are true, you can't live by this. There's only one particular faith which attempts, and I say attempts, to say that all religions are true and they won't argue doctrine about anything. And that's the Baha'i faith. I'm not going to go into what they believe exactly, but they basically say that all religions are true, doesn't matter what you believe, and we all worship the same God, we just call Him by different names, and blah, 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 blah. But ironically, the one person that I know of that's a Baha'i follower who came to this church and I was preaching on the... On the, on the return of Jesus, the future return of Jesus, sat right there in the middle of the church and stood up in the middle of everything and proclaimed to the whole church that Jesus Christ has already returned in 1865 or some such date. Basically, what did he just say? He made an absolute truth claim that Jesus Christ won't return in the future because he's already returned. You, either way around it, you are all white right-wing extremists. You can't, you can't not be. We all are. If you say that, no, 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 that's not right, that's wrong, they should believe this way. Everybody does that. Nobody abides by that. Even those who make statements like Joe Klein. You can't get around it. You can't get around it. Here's, here's the... Uh, uh, before we look at this, I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you to think about the consequences. Because I know, I know that this is... I know this is that's why I said blisters on, blisters on the brain. I know this is difficult, but I want you to think this through. Think this through. If, and this is the predominant worldview in our culture, all right? So this is the way most people think. If you don't think like Joe Klein, you're a right-winged extremist. And we've already demonstrated we're all right-winged extremists according to his own definition, including Mr. Klein. But let's just say hypothetically this is true. Let's just say hypothetically that you can't look at another culture and say, you know, what you're doing is wrong. Or that belief is not valid. If, what would that mean ethically? Let's transport ourselves back to, um, to Mississippi in, in 1810. The slave trade is active. The buying and selling of people as property is active. And, and, and you transport yourself into that culture and you're talking to an individual who owns a number of slaves and he says, this is morally acceptable, would you agree or disagree? That's a yes, no question, people. Would you agree or disagree? You disagree. You have no right. According to this, you have transported yourself into their culture at their time, and for them in their culture, it was morally acceptable. Who are you to impose your cultural values on that culture? Do you see why this doesn't work? Now, in the North, they didn't believe that. Now, here's the irony. Neither group, neither group stated that truth was relative. They said, no, there is such a thing as truth, and we have it. Slavery is acceptable. In the North, they said, no, 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 slavery is not acceptable. And in the North, they said, the Bible says slavery is not acceptable. In the South, they would say, the Bible says it's acceptable. Both of them were appealing to an objective standard to say that what they believed was true. They were not stating that all truth is relative, but yet... None of us would argue that slavery is acceptable. Is anti-Semitism acceptable? Yes or no? No. Well, that depends on when and where you lived. It was certainly acceptable in, in, uh, in Austria in the 1930s. A whole culture bought, was brought, uh, raised in that, in that, in that worldview. You, you see how dangerous that is? It doesn't fly. Is child molestation acceptable? This is a no-brainer, people. What do you think? No. But some people, those in the scientific community, and they're out there, those who believe that there is no moral absolutes, state that it is a preference just like any other sexual choice. 
Are they right or are they wrong? It depends on whether or not you can know truth. Do you, do you, see, how, do you see how this goes? How deep the rabbit hole goes? Speaking of rabbits, that is rabbit trail. I don't want to spend too much time there. I just want, to, I want you to draw your attention to it. And, and here's ultimately, if you believe this, here's a quote by G.K. Chesterton, a journalist uh, who passed away in the 60s, I believe. But here's what he wrote about our modern sentiment and how we view truth, that there is no such a thing as truth. He says, the new rebel is a skeptic and will not entirely trust anything. He has no loyalty, therefore he can never really be a revolutionist. And the fact that he doubts everything really gets in the way when he wants to denounce anything. For all denunciation implies a moral doctrine of some kind, and the modern revolutionist doubts not only the institution he denounces, but he doubts the doctrine by which he denounces it. As a politician, he'll cry that war is a waste of life. Then, as a philosopher, he'll say that life is a waste of time. A Russian pessimist will denounce a policeman for killing a peasant and then prove by the highest philosophical principles that the peasant ought to have killed himself. The man of the school goes first to the political meeting where he complains that the savages are treated as if they were beasts. Well, then he takes his hat and his umbrella and he goes to a scientific meeting where he proves that they practically are beasts. In short, the modern revolutionist, being an infinite skeptic, is always engaged in undermining his own minds. In his own book on politics, he attacks men for trampling on morality. In his book on ethics, he attacks morality for trampling on men. Therefore, the modern man in revolt has become practically useless for all purposes of revolt. By rebelling against everything, he's lost his right to rebel against anything. That is a profound observation, and that was true in in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s. It's certainly true now. Do you understand that if you take that stance, you can't take a stand on anything? You can't take a stand on anything. And very few people are willing to stand on that statement when you say that truth is relative and then someone asks you is racism acceptable in a culture that's determined it's acceptable if you're consistent you would say hmm i wouldn't say that it's immoral but i will say that it's not palatable in other words you say i don't like it but i can't say it's wrong do you really believe that Are there not certain things which are just flat out wrong? All of us live our lives as if that's true because it corresponds to reality. It's true. It's true. That which corresponds to reality. Okay. Let's let's keep moving here. Second problem with truth. From the perspective of those who, who have a problem with it. First of all, truth cannot be known. Covered that one. The second one actually comes first, but I listed it second. Follow me here. That doesn't make any sense, I know. The second one comes first, even though it's listed second. The first one, truth cannot be known, is an intellectual issue. That's why I said your brain is going to hurt. The second one is a heart issue. And the, the, the second one actually drives the first one. Truth claims restrict. Here's what that means. People have a problem with absolute truth claims because in the in the... In, in a thinking of a philosopher like Friedrich Nietzsche or, 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 or in a more modern setting, a guy like Foucault, who was a kind of a descendant of, of Nietzsche in terms of the idea that life is meaningless and there is no absolute truth, they would say that all truth claims are made by individuals or groups in order to control and manipulate people for their own selfish ends. So if if Nietzsche was sitting in the back and he was listening to me preach and I was talking about you need to follow Jesus because he's the way, the truth, and life and you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free, he would immediately be suspicious and he would say, that Simpson guy, he's proclaiming an absolute truth claim. There's got to be something in it for him. He's going to use that to manipulate and get these people to do what he wants. Now, is he wrong? Well, in my case, I hope so. But historically, have people used truth claims to manipulate and oppress people? Absolutely. So there's some truth in where these guys are going with that. But as an absolute statement, what they're saying is there's no, there's no truth anywhere. Anyone who says there is, they're just trying to milk you. Whether it's a government, doesn't matter. Right wing, left wing, any wing in between. Anybody who says here's the truth, there's something in it. They just want to control the masses for their own personal gain. Okay. That's, that's why Stalin and, uh, and, and Marx, they, kinda, they actually read Nietzsche, and that's where that came from. They didn't, trust, they didn't trust people that had power. People in power, they make the rules. They, call, they say this is true. 
right? So that's where this is going. So sometimes they're right, but it depends on who's making the truth claims. Jesus here says in verse 32, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. In their mind, Foucault and Nietzsche, they both said that restrictions, if you impose restrictions on anybody, well, that equals slavery and oppression. And and if you don't have any restrictions, that is, if there's no truth and you can't say that this is wrong and this is right, if everything is morally relative and you can choose for yourself what's right and what's wrong, well, that's liberation. That is ultimate freedom. And that is our culture. That's where we're at. What's right for you? Well, that's right for you. But that's not what I like. That's not how I love my life. So don't, you ready for this? How many of you heard this? Your teenagers say this all the time. Don't judge me. Right? There we go. Don't impose your moral restrictions on me. Don't impose your moral restrictions on me because your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. I will define for myself how I will live my life. And in doing so, I will ultimately be free. I will ultimately be free. Now, when I went, I'll back it up just so you can see it here. The second one, truth claims restrict. That's a heart issue. It's not an intellectual issue. The intellectual objections flow from the heart objections in that order, but I started with the intellectual first. Now, let me, let me read for you a statement by a very, very famous uh, atheist who's passed away some years ago by the name of Aldous Huxley. Aldous Huxley. He wrote the following regarding this very thing. He said, I had motives for not wanting the world to have meaning. I'm going to rephrase that. He says, I had motives for not wanting the world to have meaning. That could also read, and it would say the same thing, I had motives for their, the world to not, I, desiring not to have ultimate truth. Okay? If there is such a thing as an absolute truth, if Jesus has the truth, that means that there, there is meaning in life, and it's defined by Jesus. If there is no meaning and there is no truth, Well, that's what he's talking about. I had motives for not wanting the world to have meaning. Consequently, I assumed that it had none and was able without any difficulty to find satisfying reasons for this assumption. Those who detect no meaning in the world generally do so because for one reason or another, it suits their books that the world should be meaningless. For myself, as no doubt for most of my contemporaries, the philosophy of meaninglessness was essentially an instrument of, you ready for this? Liberation. The liberation we desired was liberation from a certain system of morality. We objected to the moral morality because it interfered with our sexual freedom. There was, there was one admirably simple method in our political and erotic revolt. We could just simply deny that the world had any meaning whatsoever. Similar tactics have been adopted from the 18th century for the same reason. That's in his book, Ends and Means. Do you see what he is honestly admitting here? What he's admitting is that the, 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 the denial of truth is not for him primarily an intellectual problem. It's a moral problem. He simply stated, I don't want anyone telling me who, when, and where I can have sex. Period. That's what he just said. So in other words, it is the restriction that people fear and therefore they deny the truth of whatever whoever is proclaiming the truth does that make sense so jesus says you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free and here's how this works are you going to tell me that i can't sleep around because if you are i don't like your truth and i would just as soon devise my own system where there isn't truth so i can make up my truth so i can live as however i want that's what huxley said it's like the, I was, remember uh, uh, opening a Bible study. I don't know, I've probably shared this a million times, but it fits the, fits the point perfectly with the, with the wrestling team back when I was still, still competing. And one guy came up to me, and, and uh, this guy uh, he was a heavyweight, and, and he was a um, fairly uh, wild guy. He's like, can I come to your Bible study? I'm like, of course you can come to my Bible study. He's like, you know what? I, I want to come, but I just don't know that I can be a Christian. I'm like, why not? He goes, I just don't think I could just have sex with one woman. I didn't say anything about sex. I invited him to a Bible study. But what did he He assumed, oh, you're saying that if I follow Jesus, he'll give me the truth and the truth will set me free and he's gonna keep, he wants me to keep my pants on until I'm married. Can't do that. I didn't even say it. He assumed it. He assumed it. Do you, do you see how the heart and the head are always connected? 
This is never merely an intellectual exercise. And besides that, it's not even true in real life anyway. Yes, there are people who will make truth claims in order to restrict and manipulate you. But that depends on who they are. It depends on who's making the claim. If it's any president, I don't care which party. I don't trust them. I don't trust them. I'm very, very cynical. Very, very cynical. And for that matter, when I speak, you shouldn't necessarily trust me. Not because I'm not trustworthy, but you don't know me. Unless my words correspond to what the Scripture clearly teaches, you shouldn't trust me. I, I'm right there with Nietzsche and Foucault on that. But it depends who's speaking. If it's Jesus speaking, then the question is begs, can you trust Him? You see, if Jesus is simply imposing upon you a body of truth so that he can manipulate and restrict you, well, that's not a good deal for any of us. That's just manipulation. Just add an ism. Islamism. Kamyaism. 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 There's an N in there. Socialism. You, all of these isms. Fundamentalism, all of these isms, they do seek to control people. Is that what Jesus was after here? Is he saying, you'll know the truth, you'll be my disciples, and that truth will set you free? Is he saying to you, hey, you just follow me. I'll give you the rules, you keep the rules, and then you'll be a good boy. And if I deem that you're okay, well, then you'll be in. Is that what he's saying? Is he giving us a, an abstract body of truth that he simply wants to impose upon us? Is that what Jesus is saying? That's what many people believe is saying. You see, truth doesn't always restrict, but sometimes it does. Is that always a bad thing? How many of you have ever wanted to do something great in your life? Okay, good. Not all of you are slackers. So, so anyone who aspires to do something extraordinary, um, we'll say win some athletic competition at the highest level, do you willingly impose restrictions upon yourself to attain that end? Yes or no? Those of you who said no have never attained anything at a high level. You know that to be true. Whether it's athletics or whether it's art or whether it's industry or whether it's having a good family. If you don't restrict yourself, if you don't impose certain limitations or deny yourself freedoms in other areas, you will not become free to do that which you desire to do. Is a fish free to live outside of water? No, it's restricted by its... I heard somebody say it. Design. It's restricted by its design. Who is Jesus? Turn to Colossians chapter 1 real quick. Colossians chapter 1. He is the image of the invisible God. This is verse 15. The firstborn of creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, invisible, invisible, where the thrones are dominions, rulers, authorities. All things were created through him and for him and by him. Summary. He made you for his purpose to live and be and have your being in him. You and I were designed to be free and we are freest when we live according to the way we are designed. You and I, all of us as human beings, were de designed by God to live in intimacy with that very God, to know Him, to love Him, and to be loved by Him. He desires you to find and express that freedom, and the only way that you and I can live in that freedom is to be rightly related to Him. But here's the problem. We've been separated from Him. Why have we been separated from Him? What's the problem? The problem is that we have sought our own autonomy. We've sought our own independence. We believe that any restriction equals slavery and oppression. Therefore, God, you will not tell me what to do. I will be the captain of my own ship. I will determine my own destiny. I will be autonomous. And God says, fine. And he lets us go our own way. But then as the fish flops on the side of the bank, because now it's autonomous from the water it was supposed to be in, we slowly begin to die. And those who pursue their sexual freedom outside of the way God designed them find that there's a trail, a, a, a causeway, a wake of broken relationships. You can't live outside of the way you were designed without consequences. 
Those people who desire to make their life about money will find that their relationships will suffer. Anything you give your life to, whether it's sex, whether it's money, whether it's fame, anything other than the, the God who designed you, ultimately it will ruin your life. That's why Jesus is say, says, I'll set you free. He said, but I don't, I don't know I can trust him. I don't know I can trust him. How many of you are married? Or someday you want to get married? Somebody you might not get married after I tell you this. Here's the deal. If you're married, here's a hard and fast truth. When you enter into a covenant relationship with another human being, you voluntarily restrict your freedom. You are no longer autonomous. True or false? True. Any of you that thought false, you will be divorced shortly. And I say that in all sincerity. You cannot be autonomous and be married at the same time. The two become one flesh. That's what loving relationships are about. When you love and are loved, you are not technically truly free. You're free in the context of you find your joy when you are giving yourself unselfishly and they are giving themselves unselfishly to you. And when you are in that intimacy, there is joy and you experience freedom, although you're not autonomous. Does that make sense? What Jesus is saying is, listen, you've been separated from a holy and a loving and a just God and I have come to set you free by uniting you back to him, but you've got to let me do this. And it's not just that he comes to impose truth upon you. It's Jesus who, although being in very nature God, didn't consider quality with God something he grasped, but he took the form of a servant. And he became obedient. He took on flesh. He took on blood. He fulfilled the law, the righteous requirements of the law. And then in the Garden of Gethsemane, he took upon himself your sin, your decision to be autonomous from God. He took it all. He took my sin. He took your sin. He gave himself willingly. He, the fish, stepped out of the, wa the water and put himself on dry land. And as he gasped his last on the cross, he said, it is finished. You can trust an individual who is willing to empty his veins of his blood for you so that you can have a relationship with him. He will not manipulate you. He will not oppress you. He will not suppress you. He will liberate you because you will find your being in him. That's the gospel. Now, I realize by, by virtue of the fact that I just said that means nothing to those of you who are skeptics. You're like, you've got a lot of work to do to prove anything to me. That's why this is one sermon in 12. So come back. Come back. All I'm asking all of you to do if you're a skeptic is to scrutinize your own doubts analyze what you say you believe and put it to the same rigor that what I say I believe. And if you're a Christian, analyze what you believe and rigorously examine it so that your faith will be strengthened and you'll be able to articulate your faith to other people. That's what this is about. That's what this is about. Ultimately, this is not about you believing me. This is about whether or not you believe Jesus. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. If you're shaky on who Jesus is, stick around. If you don't have a Bible, we'll give you a Bible. Pick up a Gospel of John and just start reading. Familiarize yourself with the person of Jesus Christ so you can make an informed decision on whom it is you're going to believe and trust. As the praise team comes forward, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you so much for your mercy, for your love, for your abundant provision. And Lord, I thank you for people here that are right now that don't believe. I praise you that uh, they've come. I praise you for those who do believe, but they still struggle with doubt. I praise you that they're here willing to examine those doubts and be intellectually honest with themselves and just to come before you. I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would open up eyes and that we, like that Father, who cried out to you, I do believe, but help me to overcome my unbelief. I, I pray, Father, that you would help us to overcome our unbelief. I pray that if there's somebody here that's uh, skeptical, that you would move them to at least examine what they believe and examine the claims that you made in the Scriptures. Father, I just pray that you would do a powerful work 
in this congregation and among these people so that Christ would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen.